In the criminal justice system, sexually based offenses are considered especially heinous. In New York City, the dedicated detectives who investigate these vicious felonies are members of an elite squad known as the Special Victims Unit. These are their stories. So, although I had wrote this down, I don't usually read stuff, but I'm gonna read this. So during the course of making this video, my wife informed me that one who was 14 has come forward with her own voice. Um, let me just say, I come with this very video to stand with her as fast as lightning. And let's say, I believe her. I believe you. Um, this video, if you can make it to the end, is why. Um, I think it has some points you're not gonna hear elsewhere. I stopped my video editing uh, when she told me. I asked my wife to record her voice in regard to one of the things I share about my own personal story in this, in regard to being 14, and um, ask her to share some of that. And I think maybe some of your own experience. Just, she was from Morningstar, which had its own issues. I left my editing unchanged from when I heard the news. So that, like, I didn't even finish, so it might be kind of rough towards the end, but I just felt like I wanted to freeze it in time. And I know this news, apparently you said it was yesterday. Yeah, but like, I we just found out. And it just, all the more this video for me. Um, and that's why I'm leaving it unchanged. And thank you to all my friends that have been watching along with me and encouraging and um, even, you know, the critiques and stuff. So thank you guys. Uh, I think this one's worth watching out of all of them. Maybe the first one, the blue one, and this one. <laughs> all right. The one, the thought I had, woke up about the narratives thing. And man, God has shined a spotlight on King Candy. Hello there. My name's Professor Pugsley, and I am a grandpa. I'm also a scientist. I'm a scientist and a grandpa. <laughs> With my grandkids, I'm a grandpa. In my lab, I'm a scientist. So how's it going down there? Uh, oh, sorry, my glasses came on. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to add a small point to you about this, this narrative thing. You know, where they're, they're upset because their life narrative is being challenged, apparently. And that's unsettling for them. I just want to add in, before, before Misty just sweeps this blame over all the advocates of people who have spoken up, I, I would like to point out that it was Michael Bickle's own granddaughter that first challenged and took apart uh, one of these ladies' narratives. I'm, I'm not going to throw her name out there, but she threw her name out there. Now she pretends like she doesn't want her name out there. It's so weird. But yeah, I remember specifically, I was watching a Brother John video, and I was like, way to go, Mike Bickle's granddaughter, for standing up for truth and not being like, a, you know, my wife heard this word pretty clearly the other day. So yeah, to be honest, like Mike Bickle's own granddaughter challenging this lady's narrative, the other lady's narrative challenged, whatever. I'm not, I'm not here to argue that your narrative's so bad. It's just that it's not about your narrative of you, okay? It's not about your narrative of you. And it's the same thing with Mike, who's trying to like cleave and hold on to his narrative. I mean, you guys sound a lot like him in that sense. Don't mess with God's narrative over my life. I mean, I almost feel bad for you guys. Like, I, I don't think you know what it's like to walk with the Lord in the wilderness where there, you, you, <laughs> your life problem isn't what what other people are accepting, whether they're accepting God's narrative of your life or not, okay? You know, like you guys have a real problem that you're obsessed with 
narratives. Like Mike spent decades trying to literally prophetically brainwash an entire generation, an entire generation. And how did this happen? Well, my friends, I've given this some serious thought on my little, I, I took a couple weeks hiatus after the last Misty video. It's like, this is too much. Confronting Misty Edwards, I'm probably going to get banned from the internet or something. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I just, I needed a break after that. It was, you know, but I've, I've, I've my brain doesn't exactly take breaks. So I've been thinking about a movie that, you know, I loved when it came out. And it's a, it's, it's a great movie. It's Wreck-It Ralph, okay? And if you haven't seen it, let me tell you about a character. His name is King Candy. And I see some overlap with Mike. You see, Mike was forced out of the Vineyard Fellowship by those, by the group of, I think it was Vineyard pastors and, and people that were seeing the false prophetic and, and the immorality and issues that were manifesting. And he was directly challenged. Well, you see, he left the MC Fellowship, whatever that initial fellowship was. He, he branched out from that and went doing creating his own thing, rewiring some of his, some of, in my view, the prophetic history to make the game rigged that he's the man on top. He's King Candy. Nobody talks against King Candy, right? In the, in the movie. Go Turbo. That's right. You guys just got plugged in. Back when the arcade first opened. And Turbo. Turbotastic. Well, he loved the attention. Turbotastic. So my wife said I should Drive the, <laughs> drive the points home just more translate it succinctly from the movie because a lot of people won't just draw the inferences that I'm making naturally what it comes down to is in 1997 I believe Mike Bickle did something in Paris that could only be discovered by the spirit in a way we can't go back and do certain tests and things on a, on a physical evidentiary level we need the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth to guide us is the body of Christ. And we see that men have tried hard to put up a blockade on a, a sincere investigation of what has taken place. So let me just do what I have to do as an armchair investigator following my blues clues out here. <laughs> um, let me just say, you know, uh, one, I'm not the main armchair investigator. <laughs> I'm following everybody else. But my, I, I like Blue's Clues, okay? And I'm putting some stuff together that I find significant, all right? This movie came to me. I didn't know about the 1997 thing. But in 1997, King Candy harmed a daughter in this game of this, you know, this storyline. He, by getting to her source code, I believe that was done through his prophetic manipulation of this young woman. And also what I, I consider to be grooming of sorts. And then through actual physical harm. I, I believe at this juncture, and you can follow my little part in the storyline here, if you, yeah, I've laid a, a pretty thorough case and have called myself multiple times for Mike to repent. And while I thought that might be a little call, potentially maybe just like 50 views, a lot of people heard that call. So I think that he may have heard that call and that call needs to be heard because it still stands. What I said back then, driving up the mountain. Man, you did something. I don't want to believe of you like King Candy and what ultimately happens with him. I really don't. I'd rather believe that's the spirit that's been behind you or something. But Mike, man, we I need you to come forward. I can't. We're, we're, we're all in this body of Christ called to speak to the truth. And I say to you, man... I don't accept uh, Eric Volz's narrative that like, uh, oh, you're just, you know, you're separated now and everything's good at IHOP that you laid the source code for. No, 
It's not everything's good. Like the IHOP is founded on your prophetic history. You made all those kids come and sit there and learn how all this supernatural stuff, you know, the rain that didn't even come, dude. Like I've watched through some of your prophecies that came, like uh, kudos to the messed up church guy for calling you out on stuff that Google can call you out on now. 39, where he tells the story of how he first met Bob Jones and the whole snowstorm thing. <laughs> What was it? It's a couple of flights. Wearing a winter coat, and it was about 70 degrees out. <laughs> the official weather report for that day, March 7th, 1983, high of 51, low of 34. It was about 70 degrees out. The purpose of this video, I'm just going to focus on these three things. Number one, when Bob Jones walked into the office of Mike Bickle on March 7th of 1983, it was supposed to be a really warm day, and it was really weird because he was supposedly wearing a winter coat, even though it was warm outside, when... The actual weather records show that it was actually in the 40s on that day. Number two, March 21st, 1983 was not a double winter as Bob Jones predicted it would be. It was just a regular day. It wasn't uh, snowing that day and it also was not warm enough for the snow to melt that day. So all of the predictions about what was supposed to happen that day can't possibly be true. Number three, Mike Bickle claims that Bob Jones predicted there was going to be a big, serious drought all summer long and that for one day out of the month, there was going to be a bunch of rain. And that was August 23rd of 1983, where it was supposedly a big rainstorm in the evening. But the weather records indicate that there was just a small rain shower at 8 o'clock in the morning. There was no big rainstorm, especially not later in the afternoon or evening. You know what I mean? And I still try to make room for you. I'm like, well, you know, there could have been, no, I'm not making room for you anymore, dude. I'm not, there's no more room for that stuff, dude. You have a lot more to repent of than what, than just what you did to Jane Doe. The Lord says, I'm going to raise up a people. He's talking about Kansas City now. We know he means the whole world, but he's talking to Bob about his field of labor. They will be faithful to me. I want you to pause a moment. I want you to make this, put your name on this. I want you to pause right now for 10 seconds. The Lord is raising me up that I, say your name, just whisper to the Lord, I will be faithful. This is about me. You were on the Lord's mind when he told this to Bob Jones. When God gives signs in the heavens to back up words that have to do with a global purpose and he invites you to it, you are now accountable for it and you will talk to him at the judgment seat of Christ about it. Every one of you in this room and everyone that's been in this room for the 14 years, you were sent by- All right, guys, I'm in my editing right now. I'm sorry, I just heard something that stuck out to me when I was editing this video together. I'm gonna listen to you. I have my headphones. Okay, well, you'll see it in the thing. I'll every one of you in this room and everyone that's been in this room for the 14 years, you were sent by- Play it for you. Basically, he says 14 years, all of those of you who are in here for 14 years I don't know for me I had a significant traumatic brain injury when I was 14 um, well I just feel compelled since he's bringing up this in such a weighty way to bind people to share my own life story about my 14 year old experience you know I was I was beat down by a group of drunk rednecks um a guy that really they did this to a lot of guys like they beat down a uh, big you know it was like a upper classman lacrosse player they like his dad was a freaking lawyer and they went to his house and did this and stuff so like i heard they were going around doing this i didn't mean to but i kissed this really beautiful girl in school that lots of people liked and this main dude that was going after people like was going for her you know and so like i got you know i, I decided to stand up to this guy okay because i was like well i have a little sister a little brother family i don't want i don't want them to uh come to my family's house and i'm not afraid of you dude so i decided to ride my bike in the middle of the night and go and face this guy at a friend uh abigail's house and i was left for dead 
basically. Like, they thought they had killed me, you know? And, I mean, the one guy that hit me in the back of the head, he's got, like, metal in his hand for the rest of his life. This dude, Seth. Um, and what else? I remember having the, the, this is for the friends that are following, but I think it's significant. I, you know, basically, I received the beat down of my life, you know? I mean, I was, you see my eyes, like they were all blood afterwards for like weeks, like the bloodshot stuff, my face. I mean, I looked, I was like <laughs> the walking dead or something. Anyways, so, yeah, when I was 14, that happened. And the last names of the three girls that, um, you know, he told me basically what happened, you know, afterwards, I'm like, you know, just blood everywhere. Obviously, I'm in their bathroom. They're trying to like clean, clean up the situation and bring me to awareness and I, apparently my eyes kept like rolling in the back of my head and I just kept kept repeating, telling my mom and dad that I love them. And the the last names of the girls were Nun, um, Thorn, and Faircloth. And, you know, I don't know, I felt later when I came to Christ that I had an awareness that well let's just say we're all kept here all of us because of the breath and the miracle of God himself I just feel like I need to make a quick interjection here for something I feel like the Lord is highlighting. I definitely believe this is an hour of exposure in the church. And the things that have been done in secret are now being shouted from the rooftops. They're being revealed. So <laughs> my husband was in our room you know, working, editing a video that he's about to release. And, and he has his headphones on. I don't really know. I can't hear. I was in the other room. Well, I see the article about the newest victim that's come forward that has put her name out, Tammy Woods, who was Mike's former babysitter who was groomed and sexually abused by Mike, who was 14 years old at the time. Um, I was... I realized that this, this story literally just broke. Um, I knew my, my husband clearly hasn't seen it or he would have definitely already said something about it um so I came in the room and he took his headphones off and I told him I gotta tell you something uh another woman came forward and she was 14 he literally threw his headphones down and was like oh my gosh And he plays for me a clip that he had just added to his video that he's uh, releasing that I had not seen, where he's telling the story of what happened to him when he was 14. I feel like this is so significant and that this is the Lord is highlighting this. I know there's there's going to be those who are playing the fealty game to Mike and who are are being his defenders. But I believe Jane Doe, I believe the women who have come forward, I believe Tammy Woods. 
the Lord has seen these women and and maybe others who haven't come forward yet. Tammy finally came forward and unearthed her trauma from the other women coming forward. So I just, I wanted to share that, that I had no idea that he had just added this this part about what happened to him when he was 14. And I literally come in and, and tell him about the newest woman that's come forward who was 14. I believe it matters to the Lord. It matters, and he is shining light in the dark places. And I also just want to affirm, like, what my husband has been sharing is is true. I've... <laughs> I've been there, you know, I was there for all, everything he shared, our our trip out west, our RVing, all of that. Obviously, I wasn't there when he was 14 because we hadn't met yet. But, you know, I've I've been a part of his family. We've been married for almost 13 years, and I know this is a very real story. This really happened to him, um, and he really, it, it changed him. I also believe that this is an hour that as believers, we do not want to be found on the wrong side of the shaking that the Lord himself is doing. We do not want to try to cover up and stand in the way of what the Lord himself is exposing. I can speak briefly as one who was at a ministry school, a very prominent ministry school as well, not IHOP, but I was a student at Morningstar University at Rick Joyner School. And the year I went there was the year that the scandals broke out. Leaders who had been there for decades were being exposed. Uh, Sexual scandals happened. Some of our Leaders were going after the the younger, just out of high school girls, 18, 19. I mean, very, very similar stories. This isn't isolated to just IHOP. This is something, this, this sexual sin that has been happening in the house of the Lord and where these people and men in power have been taking advantage of lambs, of daughters. The Lord says it's not okay. It's not okay anymore. By the Lord, they will talk to the Lord about this purpose. This isn't about whether you like Bob Jones or not, or you agree with everything he said, or this isn't Mike's deal. I mean it. It's some of you, you come and go as though you really have the choice to bargain with what God went out of his way to establish. Lord says, you don't get to choose any of that. I sent signs in the heavens. I raised up prophetic voices. I went out of my way to establish it. You're bound to this or we're going to have a serious talk. Yeah, bro, that's what Christ did. He's the one that raised up the prophetic reality that we're living into this day. You don't, you haven't escaped the revelation. You think that you're past the revelation of John? No, of course not. You just, you're good at manipulating it. I bind you, Mike Pickle. I bind you publicly. The Lord so cares about them. He's pinning you against the wall. He's ambushing you and saying, I'm telling you to do this. Right this very moment, I am telling you to do this. Repent. Repent for what you did to my sister in Christ. Repent before the body of Christ. You see the stage you're speaking on? Take the stage. Oh, okay, I have won't let you in. Whatever. Take the stage with your phone. You take the stage and you come and you bear your heart before the body. It is the only way forward for you who set yourself before the body for decades as the man on top, as King Candy. King Candy, I call you and your britches to account. And when you'll talk to the Lord one day and he'll say, where's your family at? Where are you at? Did you do it? I told you to do it. Not for a summer, not for a month, not for three years, for the rest of your life. I called you to this. Are you and he, talking to your husband or your wife, your children, are they doing it? As a man with a dearly beloved family, how dare you? How dare you put that on other brothers and sisters out there who also have dearly beloved families? 
you are in trouble. When I saw this, I knew you were in trouble because you placed burdens that now you yourself are unwilling to lift. You don't lift one finger to come lighten this load that's been placed on the body. Well, no, I got my missionary stipend. I put my, most of my prayer meetings, well, I didn't make all of them, but, you know, most of them. And I got sick a lot and couldn't make it. And, and yeah, I didn't, well, nobody really knew, but, hey, it seemed to work. I mean, I did it for a few years, and the Lord says, what? I sent you there, and that's your answer to me? I raised up this movement with supernatural signs and wonders and raised up prophetic voices and a global reality, and that is your answer to me? I raised up all these sons and daughters, all these sons and daughters, including your own granddaughter, to lift their voice. And that is your answer to us? That is your answer to us? You've committed inappropriate behavior? Good, I'm glad that you've joined my five-year-old. Now you gird your loins. You are in trouble and it's gonna manifest, buddy. It, dude, how much, I tell this to older people who are not on the right path and you're getting in that realm. How much time do you think you have? What are you doing? Prophecy belongs to the Lord God, Jesus. The spirit of prophecy, yeah, okay? So if you infect the source code of true prophecy, you think, you know, for listening to my cessationist homeboys, I found out about your old little stuff. You think that we all, 90% of everything that we say is false. Is that how you, maybe for you? We're going to tear a few things apart in, in ways that people may not expect. Let's, let's, let's kind of let Mike Bickle spin a few things out here. Here we go. I love the Bible more, not to have some category outside the Bible. And I believe that a whole lot of the dreams and visions aren't even real. I mean, even though the people are genuine lovers of God, and even though they might have a history of having some dreams and they actually came to pass the things they saw, I, have, I know many people that have had, you know, seen some things in dreams and then had hundreds of dreams. I don't know the number, of course, multitudes of dreams that were not prophetic at all. They were just pizza and they were not helpful. They were actually, and, but because they had two or three or four or five or 10 dreams where there were helpful information that ended up being valid and from God, that doesn't mean the next hundred are right. You know, you know there, there's a verse in the 10 correct, 100 wrong. That's like 90 plus percent wrong. What? How? How does this square with scripture? Maybe that's how it works for you, dude. I, you'd be lucky if 10% of what you said had been true. I, I give you, at this juncture, the only thing that I would give you that you've said that's been truthful is when you're reading the word. And I don't know how much you do that. Sounds like I'm being a little rough on you. I'm really not. That's exactly right, Mike. Considering what you have done in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christ. Look, if you were Jeffrey Epstein, I wouldn't be wasting my time on you. The Lord will get you with his own arrow. But you set yourself into the house of Christ over my sisters and brothers, over my own head. Because uh, via my listening to Misty Edwards, my own fault. But the thing is, dude, I have taken it easy on you. And I gave you plenty of time. We're into the next year now, so I, I'm like, we're gonna get into this. So you guys read this. This is this is a, a Jane Doe recording the facts that she can remember, you know. And it's up to us to to piece some things together here, which I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do. Turbo survived the destruction of his game, and after years of hiding in 1997. When the racing game Sugar Rush was plugged in, Turbo entered the source code, removed Princess Vanellope Von Schweetz, and took control under the alias of King Candy. Hello, my loyal subjects! <laughs> but this success didn't make sense to me. How did he figure out how to enter the source code? Why is there a lock on the source code? And why is King Candy's information so large? Today, I plan on discovering the answers to all of these questions. The, the, the source code is the prophetic storyline. That's how he did this, okay? He got into the actual, like the, the I mean, literally they come and learn 
what a mighty mandate is on this man who walks with Michael the Archangel. And what do you expect but a sense of uh, deception to enter the flock that they think this man far more highly than he needs to be thought of? Well, this to Bob Jones. When God gives signs in the heavens to back up words that have to do with a global purpose and he invites you to it, you are now accountable for it and you will talk to him at the judgment seat of Christ about it. You know, and as you see in the movie, it, 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 it mass manipulates everyone in the game because of his ability to change the prophetic storyline. So if anything that I'm learning from this is the, you know, especially in this, in the charismatic movement, you guys need to be, we need to be uh, fierce in guarding the, the, true storyline of God you know what I mean not making it more than it is or less than it is but I mean we we're commanded let the spirit of the prophets be subject to the prophets and, and let me remind you guys Paul says that in is it 1 Corinthians 14 about the spirit of the prophets being subject to the prophets directly after him talking about everyone has a word and can share you know what I mean but let it be done with order He's not talking about holy men that are walking with Michael the Archangel. He's talking about your average lamb in the flock. I, take it from me, who has spent some time with people that would not be invited to speak, certainly on a stage at a church. They have the word of the Lord too. That homeless, broken man, listen, I learned this early in my faith. He knows something that the highest and mightiest, <laughs> let me not use the example of the Pope, for he's not very high and mighty, is he? Uh, but you know what I'm saying. The, the ones that we perceive, the, the, the MIT professors, okay? Those guys lack bits of knowledge that that homeless, broken woman over there holds. We have to come to terms with this in the body of Christ. There's no superstars except Jesus. He's our superstar. I'm so sick of people that think themselves high when the Christ is the one who paid the price. He paid the price for every lamb to be esteemed in his eyes. But Ralph, he knows something's not right, you know? He doesn't really give a about King Candy, okay? But he had to come into the world as he's fulfilling his own life path, all right? <laughs> Trying to find a medal. This is that candy go-kart game over by the whack-a-mole. I gotta get out of here. Oh no, my medal. What, what, wait, wait, what, what? No, no! No, I'm not a hobo, but I am busy. Okay, so you go, go home. What's that? Didn't hear you. Your breath is so bad it made my ears numb. Be a good, a good guy, you know? And it's just, to me, it's, it's such a picture of, of what's happened here this this game that just like you know all these writers going around and around but in the movie there's this this glitch that that manifests in the end and it brings down king candy and his false empire where he had deceived everybody doesn't mean that they're you know their candy world was real. It was awesome, and racing and all that stuff. But it had been, somebody had got into like the core files and they had twisted what it was meant to be. And, you know, I'm not claiming to be a prophet or anything. I'm clearly sharing a Wreck-It Ralph movie. So it's, it's not exactly a, a, a high mark of prophetic intuition, I'm sure. However, I do think that we would be wise to learn from this kid's movie in relation to what Mike Bickle has done. And, you know, it, it just may be the hour of Wreck-It Ralph and the glitch being freed. Yeah.
had copied to create his appearance, and I think these changes to the system left the game broken. You can't mess with the program. I know that might be hard for some people to accept that they've been playing a game for so many decades. I mean, they, hey, the game was in there for decades, you know? He had jumped ship and gotten to where he was a top racer. <laughs> That's another thing, like this idea that he would send these interns to go study for him about the end times. You know, early in my faith, I used to spend the weekends at the library and have all these like uh, old the old commentaries, you know, guys from like the 1600s. Let's hear what they say. <laughs> let's try the 1400s. And then the, you know, that would literally drown myself in the knowledge of those that went before me. I mean, I would spend the entire day just at the library, just and and not not like a drudgery. It wasn't like oh, I gotta go do. It was like, dude, I was voraciously hungry. I mean, I used to fill out just journals of thoughts interconnecting and all sorts of things that you know I used to write down and and consider. I remember before I left for the military. You know, since my early faith, I had three or four years, you know, I've been walking with the Lord. And I remember I was at, uh, I, don't, I don't remember how this happened, but I was at a hotel, I guess just to be away from home. I was living at home at that time. And uh, I had all my, the, be the bed was covered, like, you know, probably a couple of feet high with all my journals and notes and all sorts of things that I would taken since I started walking with Christ. And as crazy as this is, it, I felt to let it all go, you know? It's like, Lord, it was before I was leaving for the military, you know, you can't take much anyways, but I just wanted these things. Lord, what's from you? Let it be written in my heart. And what's not, let it, let it be given to the wind, you know? And I don't know. I just, I thought of that when I, when I heard that he used to send these interns that he was, Predatorial over uh, to study for him. He'd pay them, I guess, the flocks tithing money so that they could go study for him and live in the apartments he paid for. You know, is that part of the narrative that you're, you're bothered about, Misty, that you live in an apartment that's paid for under Mike Bickle or the Ministry of IHOP or something? I don't, I don't know. She didn't really share. She just blurred herself together with somebody that... Literally, Mike Bickle's own granddaughter was calling out for the trouble she had caused to other marriage and, and probably within her own family, or she wouldn't have been speaking out about it. And it's like, this is what I mean with you guys bringing your skeletons and drama onto the body of Christ, not his granddaughter. Thank God for her for speaking up and not letting these other drama-filled people spread their lies, you know? But I would say if you haven't cleared it with Mike Bickle's granddaughter, Misty, in relation to the narrative over this woman, and you know, yeah, you guys do have a conflict of narrative. Even before you get to the advocate group, you have a conflict of narrative within Mike Bickle's own house, okay? So, if you can't work it out within your own house that you're, you know, in allegiance and fealty to, then don't bring a word or, or a, a a, a pseudo what i'll call a pseudo narrative at this point because you haven't established what's the true narrative really we're just supposed to accept this lady who's written off by mike bickle's own granddaughter we're just supposed to accept her narrative but we're not supposed to accept the advocates who didn't come forward with the narrative about the women they haven't come forward saying anything about them you guys are the only ones that have sought to smear them they didn't come out to smear you isn't that interesting who would you trust you know I mean, ultimately, it's good for me to, you know, I think there's only a couple people on the earth that I would even have an issue of, like, looking up to too much. And Misty Edwards was certainly one of them. And, and this is shattered that idea in the healthiest of ways. And so I think that, I mean, I'm grateful that's happened. But you can't help to have that tinge of sadness that like, oh man, you know, they can't, they're, they're really bound up in the blah, blah, blah.
sucks, blah, blah, blah. So that, that whole blah, thing blah, blah, blah. put in me. Of course, there's the blah, 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 that Mike Bickle likes to write about in regard to a serious offense in the body of Christ. Narrative of Mike Bickle, if you ask me. And that's something only the Lord can free them from. You know, I can't. <laughs> My knowledge and propaganda isn't going to deliver Misty Edwards. So, you know, may she be delivered. May these women, you know, they have apparently, and I agree with Mike Bickle's granddaughter, caused problems. You know, may you repent for your own problems before you come out speaking to the body of Christ. That's all I'm saying. This key mistake left Turbo knowing if he wanted to reside in a game permanently without damaging the user's ability to play the game, he would need to implement larger changes in the source code next time. After being dormant for many years, likely studying and plotting his next move for dominance in a video game again, Turbo finally entered Sugar Rush sometime after the game entered the arcade in 1997. This time, he learned from his previous mistakes with Road Blaster by acting more stealthily, accessing the elevator to the code in secret, and implementing a massive number of changes to his code and the games to generate a working game and himself in the correct style. All of his many foreign changes and additions are why I think King Candy's block of code is so much larger than the block surrounding him and why his is a different color. Different spirit altogether. Yeah, and let me just leave you guys with the image of, you know, I think it's about as many girls as, as Misty claimed to stand with, like five of them or something. When there was a narrative that came forth in King Candy's game, let me just put it this way. I believe that they reacted very similarly. Yeah, well, King Candy says glitches can't race. I'm not a glitch tat, I just got pixlexia, okay? The rules are there for a reason, Vanellope, to protect us. Say I'm you, I'm in my weird little car, and I'm driving, and I actually feel kind of cool for once, and then all of a sudden, oh no, I'm gl 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 glitching. Hey, see, you're an accident just waiting to happen. Oh no, I gl 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 glitched too. Hey, hey. I'm cool. You're great at glitches. Oh, please! I just want to erase like you guys. You will never be eraser because you're a glitch, and that's all you'll ever be. Hey, leave her alone! Little cavities, throw you in the mud. Ah. <sighs> to the young women that couldn't handle the narrative of their game being challenged, even though their core files had been corrupted, they couldn't see that, could they? No. But their reaction is very similar. It's very similar to the girl that was the glitch. What? I will call not Jane Doe. And the reason I, I won't call her Jane Doe is because I see what these women are doing. They're trying to claim themselves as Jane Doe's so that they can say, oh, there's no Jane Doe's that are harmed. No, no, it's all that. It's just this one over here. See all these Jane Doe's, they said they're not, they're trying to obfuscate it. So I say, Mary Jane, who you are not, Misty. None of those that came forward are Mary Jane. Only Mary Jane is Mary Jane. Only the glitch who was actually harmed by King Candy is the glitch. You guys don't get to just tear apart her own story and her own uh, experience and write it off as a expression of victimhood. You know, yeah, I, it's disgusting, you know? It's disgusting how you guys acted All right, <clears throat> so I think the moral of this video is that, you know, the donut cops aren't gonna stop Rick and Ralph. <laughs> they don't work. And, you know, and neither are the mean kids. They're, they're not gonna stop. 
the truth of her story. Hey, so I'm interjecting here from my uh, my editing program because before you know, I'm, I I saw this on Twitter, and I don't know what it is fully, but it just. It may, they may be trying to make fun, but for me, I just, I felt my heart grieving. I don't know, I haven't done Twitter pretty much all my life, so <laughs> uh, I was, I know they do all these gift things, they're called, and this one just especially, I don't know, it's probably silly. I just started literally tearing up and I felt like, man, <laughs> um, uh, what I'm not good. This is so silly, but it just I felt something. Like man, there there is. Oh what? There's a little lamp. Oh, I'm not doing this. All right, I'm turning this off. <laughs>